Alrighty, folks, we got a doozy here for you today. Get ready for a full recap of the main lore of Adventure Time. Hold your applause, hold your applause, just get ready for the good stuff. I can hear it all at the end, don't you fret. You might be wondering, Chartoon, why are we applauding for Adventure Time? What makes it so different from the other Cartoon Network shows? Well, let me explain. Adventure Time runs a total of 10 seasons, 259 episodes, and even has its own musical movie. You heard me, musical. Adventure Time is one of the newer cartoons from Cartoon Network, featuring absolutely stunning animation and bright character designs. It's clear why Adventure Time has won the hearts of millions. Disclaimer, I'm not gonna lie. This cartoon is heavy in lore. It contains different storylines and overall just a lot in general. I'm going to be doing this episode differently in the sense that I'm going to be giving you more than just the main meat of the show. If you're interested in where all the humans went in the Land of Ooh, Marceline's backstory, Simon turning into the Ice King, and the miniseries Elementals that dives into the elements of Ooh, then you're in for a lot of luck. I'll be putting tabs on the different sections of the video so as not to confuse you too much. And some information might bounce around from one subject to another, but never fret. If you're already an Adventure Time nerd, then it won't be a problem. If this is your first time hearing about Adventure Time, then I encourage you to watch the character introduction section first, and then the main meet. After that, feel free to watch the other sections to dive deeper into the show. If you guys end up liking this video, please let me know in the comments. If you'd like to learn more about Adventure Time and all it has to offer, such as Flame Princess's backstory, Bemo's creation, gender swap episodes, the Earl of Lemongrab, Jake's parents, and many more interesting side quests that Adventure Time has to offer. Maybe, if you're lucky, I'll talk about relationship episodes so you can get the inside scoop on partner drama. Anyways, back to the task at hand. Here's some context for you. Adventure Time takes place in the land of Ooh a magical land where cool things can happen. Finn is our main character, a boyish boy who seems to be the only human around. We'll get to that later. Jake is his dog, who can talk and also shapeshift his body into anything he wants to. Bimo is the cutest game boy around. We love Bimo. He lives with Finn and Jake, and he's always so helpful whenever they're in danger within the house. Bimo gets beat up a lot, but it's okay because he always pulls through. Princess Bubblegum is the princess of the Candy Kingdom. She's the person who resembles a human the most. Of course, she's made out of bubblegum. She's super sweet, literally, and Finn has a major crush on her. Marceline is a vampire girl, whose father, Hunson Abadir, is canonically, basically Adventure Time's version of Satan. He rules the underworld and deals with the dead. He constantly wants Marceline to take over for him, as is her birthright, but she isn't evil like he is. She is, however, constantly getting into trouble, but has a kind heart and enjoys Finn and Jake's company. Ice King, who is presumably the main antagonist of the show, he's just a lonely guy living his lonely guy life. And by that, I mean he constantly kidnaps the princesses of the show and forces them to date him. For someone named Ice King, he isn't very cool. Gunter is a penguin who's Ice King's right-hand man and wingman. Get it? Because he's a penguin. He'll come into play later, if you're wondering why I included him. Lumpy Space Princess is a super common character who Finn and Jake interact with constantly. She's a lumpy purple cloud who's in love with her own lumps. We love a confident queen. She often annoys Finn and constantly wants him to date her. Lumpy Space Princess talks with a valley girl accent and is quite sassy. Oh my gosh, you guys! The Lich, which is a being that represents the inevitable death of all living things. Billy, who is a mighty hero and legend that Finn and Jake look up to quite a lot. The first episode is all about a slumber party at the Candy Castle. Well, of sorts. The episode starts with Princess Bubblegum doing experiments with Finn in the graveyard, trying to bring candy people back to life. The experiment backfires, much like how every single zombie movie starts, and the candy people turn into zombies. In order to cover for her mistake, Princess Bubblegum has every single person from the Candy Kingdom join her in the main candy foyer for a big slumber party. Nice, nice play. Surely they'll never find out. Princess Bubblegum seems very alarmed and tells Finn that if the candy people get too scared, they will literally explode. <coughs> because of the panic it would cause, Princess Bubblegum makes Finn royally promise not to tell anyone. Unfortunately for him, Jake doesn't like not being in on the inn. 
Jake consistently pressures Finn into finding out about the information, but Finn distracts him with different games like Truth or Dare, or even Seven Minutes in Heaven, which he makes Jake play with Lady Rainicorn. While these games do distract Jake, Finn gets even more worried when he can start to hear the zombies banging on the door. He creates other games to distract the people, like a dance party, barricade the doors, and a piñata celebration. When the candy people hit the piñatas, zombies, they eat the candy inside of them. Gross. Once Jake and Lady Rainicorn come out of the closet, Jake demands that Finn tell him what's going on. Finn tells him, which also means he breaks his royal promise. This is apparently punishable by death. But since Princess Bubblegum loves Finn, she just makes him solve some math problems instead. I thought of a better one. Yes, two plus two. When doing math problems, Princess Bubblegum realizes the last number to the equation she was trying to figure out in order to return the candy people back to normal, and she succeeds. Everyone is reunited with their respective family members and are happy. Okay, this episode starts off with Finn and Jake goofing off in the Ice Kingdom when all of a sudden they run into none other than Ice King. Ice King is annoyed by their antics and freezes them in ice blocks to take them up to his dungeon. Once there, they find that Ice King has like seven princesses already locked up in there. The princesses say that Ice King kidnapped them all here to marry one of them, basically interviewing them to see who he would want to marry the most. I'm collecting them all first to be sure I make the right choice. He even reads them books, which are all extremely boring, and they hate that. Finn devises a plan to escape and tells the others to pretend like they're having a bunch of fun. Get her. <laughs> only for Ice King to join them. But when he does, Finn kicks Ice King and he runs into the cell bars only to pass out. During his dream, he sees the Cosmic Owl, a very important spiritual being, telling him that he's a sociopath and that's why nobody likes him. Ice King wakes up to Gunter and other penguins tickling him. Well, maybe you should talk to someone with more life experience. Like Jake! Whoa, 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 Finn, what are you doing? This episode starts with Jake scaring Finn about a vampire story. Coincidentally, it also just so happens to be the night Marceline makes her appearance. After being so spooked by the story, Finn goes downstairs to talk to Jake about it, when all of a sudden, Marceline barges in. She claims that their treehouse is actually hers from a bunch of years ago, and that she's just been traveling and going on adventures since last time she'd been there. After storytelling, much to Finn and Jake's dismay, she kicks them out of the house and into a thunder thunderstorm. This forces Finn and Jake to go house hunting. Home is anywhere where people care about you. And when they finally find an acceptable cave to live in, Marceline shows up yet again claiming that the cave was also hers from a long time ago. Finn gets pissed and says she can't keep stealing their home, but Jake responds with, home is where the heart is. Finn then says it's okay, because Jake is his actual home, to which Marceline claims she can take him too. This absolutely enrages Finn, and he smacks Jake out of her hands. This causes Marceline to turn into a giant bat and start aiming to kill this time. She presumably actually does kill Jake by sucking out all of his blood, seeing that Finn punches her in the face to make her stop, which she claims actually hurt. Hurt. That actually hurt Finn. <laughs> She's impressed by both of them, Finn for actually hurting her and Jake for somehow surviving the encounter, and decides to let them have their old house back and calls it a gift. In this later episode, we meet Billy, who is Finn and Jake's number one hero. The episode starts with Finn and Jake doing as they do and saving someone. Aw, my pleasure, ma'am. After they save the person, they find a sword that just so happens to be Billy's old sword. Upon trying to lift it, they find his cave and are super excited to meet him. They have a long chat about how Billy doesn't use violence anymore to fight evil. He urges the boys to try and not use violence, since evil will always return no matter what. This puzzles the boys, as they've never not used violence, and also Billy is known for his brave violent acts. After a whole day of trying not to use violence, the boys prove to be unsuccessful. All of a the sudden, they see an old lady being beat up by a large swamp giant. Finn decides he's had enough of being non-violent and saves the woman by defeating the swamp giant. Finn and Jake go back to Billy to share the good news of what he did by using violence. This old lady is alive because of these. And all of a sudden, Billy's old spirit seems to return as he congratulates them. Marking the first episode that Ice King actually starts to remember Marceline, the episode starts off with him just wanting advice on how to write a good song. As per usual, the Ice King is trying to woo the princesses of Ooh. See what I did there? Anyway, he flies to Marceline's house to write a song with her, since he knows she's talented at music. Oh, Bob! 
bubble gum. I really need someone. During their writing, the Ice King asks Marceline for a hug, which she gives him, and he misinterprets this and tries to kiss her. This causes Marceline to fling him away and question if he actually doesn't remember who he is. Duh, you don't remember anything, do you, Simon? What, man? From then on, she calls him Simon, which is his actual real name. Marceline explains that before the Mushroom War, he was a human scientist named Simon. He took care of her and was like a father figure. Once he found the ice crown and put it on, it slowly took over his mind and caused him to become slightly insane and hold the powers of the crown itself, allowing the wearer to do ice magic and other jazz. She tries showing him photos and even shows him a note that he wrote to her before he went insane, but Ice King still doesn't remember. All of this happens in song form, by the way. What is going on in there? Ice King is silly. At the end of the episode, there's a flashback of Simon wiping away Marceline's tears and giving her a stuffed animal. In this next episode, Marceline tells Finn and Jake all about her past with the Ice King. Approximately 996 years ago, her and Simon wandered around after the Great Mushroom War alone. Simon was in possession of the Ice Crown, but only put it on in hopes to protect Marceline. Simon heard a noise in the woods and put the crown on just in case he needed to protect her, but it ended up just being a deer. Marceline is scared of who Simon becomes when the ice crown is worn and asks him to never put it on again. Mute. Simon notices that Marcy is getting a fever after seeing her coughing. He decides to take her back into town since he saw a soup store, but unfortunately, once there, no soup is found. Although, they do run into a weird slime monster that Simon hits with his crown. Later, while still in the city, she just needs a little love. Wowzers! Simon and Marceline run into even more slime monsters, while Simon ends up having to put on the crown to protect Marceline from them, even after her begging him not to do it. He succeeds in protecting her, but the transformation is concerning, and he even calls her Gunter instead of Marceline. I love you, Simon. I love you, Gunter. Signaling the lore about how Gunter has a big part in the crown's powers and the land of Ooh in general. The show comes back to real time, and it's shown that Finn and Jake have a newfound appreciation for the Ice King. Marceline, cover your ears! Mother, 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 mother. After crashing a secret wizard meeting and an anti-magic creature, Bellanoche, being summoned, Ice King loses his powers and becomes Simon again. He steals a magic carpet and flies back to the Ice Kingdom to enter his secret library, where his normal clothes, notes, and research were held. He finds an old photo of young Marceline and calls her right away asking for her help. He wants to create a time machine so that he can go back and be with Betty before he dies from not having the power of the Ice Crown. Since he's like a bajillion years old, he needed Marceline's stuffed animal, Hambo, since he needed an object with great sentiment to be destroyed in order to create the portal. After the portal is created, he sees Betty and tells her how sorry he is. I opened this portal so we could say goodbye. You're dumping me? No! She jumps into the portal, showering him with kisses. She learns of his illness since he fell to the floor and decides to go defeat Bellanoche in order to save him and get the crown back. Simon doesn't really want to be the Ice King again, but Betty promises that she will find a way for him to survive without the crown once he's safe again. Betty ends up defeating Bellanoche, and all the wizards are granted their magic back. Ice King has no memory of what happened and continues kidnapping princesses. Betty is seen sadly watching as she flies away on the magic carpet. This episode begins with PB and Marceline flying to the Ice Kingdom to attend a dinner party with Ice King. Though PB is worried, Marceline assures her that all will be well. I upgraded my home karaoke system. While there, PB notices that something is wrong with his crown. Marceline doesn't agree until he wags out and starts smashing things with his head. PB knocks him out with an icicle and takes him back to her lab at the Candy Kingdom to further find out what's going on. Once at the lab, Marceline and PB enter a VR and are transported into the crown. Once there, they find a dinosaur version of Gunther. Are you a dinosaur? I'm a Gunther. And are told that the abnormalities have been happening for a while, and that every time it happens, the landscape of the crown has changed. Gunther takes the two girls to the professor, who is the smartest person he knows. The professor ends up being Simon. Him and Marceline greet each other, and Simon explains that he's been trying to fix slash figure out what is going on for quite some time. They turn a corner and find Betty, or at least her floating head. 
messing with the crown and rearranging it. She's trying to make it so the crown still grants him immortality, but doesn't mess with him mentally. PB is worried that she's going to cause irreversible damages, so they then try and catch her. They fail multiple times, and the only reason she ends up stopping is because Simon begs her to. She remembers who she is and kisses him, apologizing for all that she has messed up while trying to fix him. PB is happy because the crown begins to stabilize itself and because of this, begins to push foreign entities out of itself. The episode ends with a satisfied Ice King, thinking that the dinner went wonderfully. It's like her data left a shadow print on the circuitry. Hmm. Even though not remembering anything from his Simon form. All right, starting off the Marceline episode strong is Henchmen. We already met Marceline, and as of right now, she kinda has been a jerk, messing with Finn and Jake, kicking them out of their homes, and all that jazz. In this episode, Marceline is seen being extremely rude to her henchmen. So rude, in fact, that Finn asked to take his place because he feels so bad for the guy. Henchmen for life means henchmen for life! While her henchman Finn is asked to do a lot of things that seem morally wrong. Except they aren't. She sucks the blood out of a guy's bow tie, much to Finn's relief as he thought she was going to kill him. She leads an army of the undead into the kingdom. Sorry, Finn. Which ends up just being a performance for a little kid's birthday. And finally, she orders Finn to kill a plant that looks super cute, but ends up being a menacing monster. This is when Finn finally realizes that behind Marceline's scary exterior, all of her deeds seem right and even friendly in hindsight. I'm not falling for your junk anymore, lady. Jake, on the other hand, is convinced that Marceline is evil and has put some evil vampire spell on Finn since he's wrapped around her finger. Jake wants to kill Marceline to save Finn, even after Finn tries to explain that she isn't evil. So Finn devises a plan to make it look like Jake does kill her to make him stop being suspicious of their friendship. It works, and they agree to hang out later. This episode begins with Finn learning of Marceline's rocky relationship with her father through her song about him stealing her french fries. Finn decides it would be a good idea to summon her father from the Nidosphere so they can work things out, without Marceline's consent first. Once in Ooh, her father tries sucking the souls out of everyone he comes into contact with, one being Gunter, which he claims is the most evil soul he's encountered in Ooh. He's unsuccessful. Keep your crummy soul. Meanwhile, Finn is trying to stop him, and Marceline is trying to get her guitar back. Finn ends up fighting Abadir, and successfully slashing his head shows his true form, and all the souls that he's stolen from Ooh. After Marceline gets her guitar back, she starts to leave, seemingly uninterested and angry with her father. Finn, not knowing what else to do, starts playing her recorded song about how hurt she was that he stole her fries. This causes Abadir to actually talk to his daughter about his mistakes in wronging her. They have a touching heart to heart, and during this, Finn sends him back to the Nidosphere. What's with that pocket on your shirt? Oh, Jake's in here. Sup, Jake? This episode is part of a two-part series. The episode begins with Finn and Jake being locked up inside the Nidosphere with no remembrance as to why. What's up with this? Uh, oh, 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 sick! They go on a journey to find the Teller in order to ask Abadir if they can leave. While waiting in a line that seems like it lasts forever, spirits start dying left and right. That's us! Yay! No! As if they were there to try and ask Abadir any type of question. Finn and Jake follow the smoke that was killing them back to where it came from and realize that they were suddenly inside Abadir's house. Abadir appears and tells them that nobody is allowed to leave the Nidosphere. They argue and end up finding a portal to jump back home. Abadir follows them into the portal and they fight. Once slashed, it's revealed that the demon isn't Abadir, it's Marceline. Marceline warns them to never return. Part 2 starts off with Finn and Jake charging up their phone to find out what happened before they get locked in the jail cell. The videos on the phone show that they were actually invited to the Nidosphere by Marceline. Once there, her father asked her to take over for him and she refused. He gave her an amulet and claimed that it could grant any wish. She still said no, but tried on the amulet just for fun. This resulted in her turning into her demon form and becoming crazy, which is when she locked Finn and Jake in jail. The boys decide that they need to go save her. They dress up like demons to fit in, and once there, they find the real Abadir. They confront him about what's happened, and he thinks it's just wonderful that Marceline has been possessed and he's always wanted her to take over the family business. Frustrated, Finn slaps his sandwich out of his hand, but doesn't do anything else. Probably in fear that he would get murdered. Hey, buddy, I get it. Step back! 
Back! You will not cut the line! Finn and Jake make their way back to Marceline and are successful in taking off her amulet. But Jake is in need of saving as he's being absolutely nibbled on by demons. Finn puts the amulet on to save them all. And after he moves, all the demons he sends Marceline and Jake back to the real world. However, Finn begins to want them back as he's now possessed by evil. Right before he's able to, Abadir rips the amulet off and says sorry to Marceline. He also jokingly says that he actually likes her friends. This episode marks the beginning of a mini-series all about Marceline, called Stakes. The episode starts off with Marceline being tired of being a vampire. She approaches PB, who's now living in a separate cabin with Peppermint Butler, and asks her to perform the procedure they've been talking about. Very, very excited to test my new lab out on you. Once it is complete, PB says it is going to take some time to make sure it actually worked. That night, Marceline has a nightmare about sucking the blood of cows. The next day, villagers go to Finn and Jake for assistance when they realize that all of their cow's blood has been sucked. Finn and Jake go to Marceline to try and find out what happened, as she is the only vampire left in Ooh, so it has to be her. She denies doing it. Meanwhile, the villagers watch Finn and Jake converse with her and decide the only way to protect themselves is to kill her themselves. Uh, a little help. <laughs> That night, they kidnap her and tie her to a stake in order for the sun to burn her alive. Finn complains to the leader and explains that they're going to kill one of his friends. Finn tries to save her, and she tells him to burn all of her diaries so nobody can read them. Right before the sun hits her, the episode ends. Continuing on with the last episode, this episode starts off with Marceline having flashbacks from her life right before she gets hit by the sun. Her first flashback is of her as a young girl sitting with her mother in a trailer home. Her mom is explaining how she met her father. Her second flashback is of Simon saying goodbye to her. He's claiming that he wants to leave before he accidentally hurts her, as he descends into madness at the expense of the ice crown. She doesn't want him to leave, but he doesn't have a choice. Her next flashback is in her vampire hunting era, which is how she originally became a vampire in the first place. Every time she murdered someone, she would suck their souls and gain their power. A later flashback reveals Marceline hunting for prey in the woods, just a little bunny. But when she catches it, she realizes that it's a little girl. She releases the girl and tries to calm her down, but the girl reports her to her tribe. They're scared of Marceline until she sings them some songs. They really like the songs. She's then transported to another memory of the human tribe. They're packing up their things to leave, sensing that something wrong was going to happen in the atmosphere. Right after saying this, vampires appear out of nowhere, one being the Vampire King. Marceline fights them off, even after being severely injured. Blah, I don't care. Fine. She had previously thought that she had already killed all of the other vampires. She tells the humans that they have to leave since the Vampire King has arrived. The episode then cuts to present-day Marceline, not harmed by the sun and still standing there. The sun evaporates her bite marks, and she's no longer a vampire. Jeez. I hope Finn didn't get blood sucked after I stress fainted. The episode ends with Jake waking up in a cave and seeing a vampiric creature turn into shapes seen in the episode, one being the Vampire King. The vampires are awakened in their cave and are confused as to how they are alive. They remember Marceline killing them, but they claim that it feels like a dream. With arguments on where they should reside, they all end up splitting up, deciding to go their own ways in this new life. Jake finds Finn and Marceline and asks them about the vampire activity. Marceline is confused, as she has killed all of these vampires a long time ago, and they all go back to PB's cabin. Once there, PB says that the only remainder of what happened to Marceline is the essence that they sucked out of her, which upon looking for it has gone missing. Upon seeing a sketch of the Vampire King that Peppermint Butler drew, she goes back into yet another flashback, this time of her battling the Vampire King. Right before she's about to stake him, he bites her neck, resulting in her also being turned into a vampire, thus preserving his species even in death. Back in real life, Marceline demands that they all start preparing for a battle with the vampires. When she eventually finds the Vampire King, he claims that he's now just eating normal animals like everybody else. While having this conversation, Marceline sucks the soul of the vampire who gave her the power of flight. She was tired of not being able to fly anymore. The Vampire King tells her of the Empress's plan to take over the Ice Kingdom. Marceline quickly goes off to rescue Ice King, who is her Simon. I could have snapped and done you all in at any time. <laughs> the fourth episode in the miniseries starts with the Empress hypnotizing the Ice King to do whatever she asks of him. I'm 
Empress, my darling, my great eternal love, how can I serve you? She asks him to bring blood, and he brings her penguins. She says she wants human blood, and the Ice King explains that Finn is the only one left, so she orders him to get Finn for her. While away, Marceline almost defeats the Empress, but before she can, the Ice King emerges with Finn. Worried that the Empress bit Ice King, Marceline quickly becomes distracted with her plan to take her out and rushes over to him. The Empress orders the Ice King to capture them both, and in a panic, Marceline starts explaining why she started hunting vampires in the first place. She flashes back to when she was a teenager, how she protected a man that looked like Simon from being bitten by a vampire. Ice King begins to cry hearing the story, but shackles them anyways as the Empress asks. When ordered to kill Marceline, he refuses, and when he finds out that he was never actually hypnotized, he just likes serving women. Oh, come on, Ice King, that is so gross. Anyway, PB shows up and stuns the Empress, allowing an opening for Marceline to stake her. She sucks her soul and agrees to hunt down the others. Simon, it's over. <sighs> it's gonna be okay, man. No, no, this way, this way. The episode starts with Finn, Jake, Marceline, and PB following orbs left behind by Moon, who's the next vampire Marceline wants to slay. The show then cuts to the King of Ooh, going hunting in the woods. That is, until he's bombarded with the shape-shifting vampire, Hierophant. The vampire demands that the King of Ooh tell him where Marceline is, and after being scared to death, they draw a map for him. Hierophant shows up to the cabin and asks to be let in by Peppermint Butler. May I come in? which it is then revealed that he can't actually enter unless invited in, much like old-fashioned vampires. Peppermint Butler obviously doesn't, but the vampire notices footprints leading away from the house, so he follows those instead. Peppermint Butler sends a text to PB to warn them about the upcoming danger. Hierophant catches up to them, and a long battle ensues Goose? I'm a vampire. <laughs> until Jake sees the text from Peppermint Butler about him not being able to enter houses without permission. Jake then turns himself into a house and they all pile inside of him. The vampire then tries talking Marceline into an alliance to defeat the vampire king as he does not like him either. She agrees, only under the condition that he wouldn't ever be able to drink blood again, just shades of blood, like she does. He says no and starts fighting with her yet again, when all of a sudden, Crunchy, the guy who the King of Ooh was pretending to hunt runs into the vampire and forces him to enter the house. Because he's not allowed to do this, he bursts into a pile of bones on the floor. Slowly, Marceline seems to be growing ill from a cut in her arm, which greatly worries PB. While knocked out, Marceline has a touching dream of her bringing Simon and Betty flowers as they make a cute pie. PB is quite worried about Marceline and blames herself for all that has happened. While the boys are trying to cheer her up, she remembers the poison lab she has back at the castle and orders the boys to find the moon, which is the vampire they were wanting to attack earlier, and meet her back at the castle, hoping to be able to use the moon's healing powers. The only problem is PB sounded like she said stake her, not take her, so the boys try to kill her whenever they finally find her. Let's stick with PB's plan and try staking her a bunch of different ways. The boys make her chase them to the castle, where PB, Marceline, and Peppermint Butler are in the poison room. Finn barges in with Jake and the moon. PB and Marceline hide in the safe while Jake and Finn try to fight the moon but are unsuccessful, as she keeps making them pass out. PB resorts to lightly slapping Marceline's face, asking her to wake up. Meanwhile, Marceline has a dream that she's much older, living with PB and Peppermint Butler. Her dream becomes a nightmare, and she wakes up as Peppermint Butler puts a stake through the moon. She sucks the moon's soul and heals right away. This episode starts with PB, Finn, Marceline, and Jake eating sandwiches in the forest when the Vampire King appears. The gang immediately flings to attack, but the Vampire King insists that he doesn't want to fight them. After much hesitation, Marceline finally agrees to not fight him anymore, as he wants his vampirism taken away for good. Here we go. They are successful in taking out his vampire liquid, and he turns into a normal lion. PB orders Peppermint Butler to take the essence and bury it somewhere, as it is extremely dangerous. But before he's able to do it, he's accidentally knocked over by Jake in his sleep, and it explodes into the land of Ooh. The last episode of the Stakes miniseries starts with Marceline refusing to fight the vampires alone. After the vampire essence escapes and turns into a big version of a lion, the others want to fight, but Marceline seems to be over it. 
She claims that fighting vampires has only led her to bad endings. Getting rid of her vampireness led to even more bad. And surely, trying to fight another dark cloud of vampire will be bad, too. Not even Finn and Jake are able to convince her to join the fight. While Marceline sits back and waits out the fight, Ice King shows up. She's excited to see him and only ever references him as Simon. See our Simon and Marcy section of the video to learn more about their past. She gives him a hug and is amused by him, saying that the reason he showed up was because he saw all the fighting and felt left out. The Ice King tells Marceline that they are survivors, much like cockroaches or rats, since they're just hiding. This prompts Marceline to join the fight, since she doesn't want to be known as a cockroach or a rat. She joins the fight, sucks up all the vampire energy, rendering her a vampire once more. Her friends help her back to her original home, and she talks about how she doesn't mind being a vampire anymore, as she has become more mature and grown up. Also, super important side note, during the battle, the citizens of the Candy Kingdom overthrow the King of Wu and get PB back as their ruler. This episode begins with Finn getting kinda weird after PB points out that he's the last human alive. Finn normally tries his best to not have thoughts like this and distracts himself by doing the task that she had asked him and Jake to complete for her. They start pulling up stumps, which was their task, and run into a sort of hatch that kinda looks like a stump but definitely isn't. They then run into a bunch of what seems to be humans, all wearing animal hats like Finn. But they don't really know English, and they're also scared of basically everything around them. One of these humans, who names herself Susan, is more responsive than the others, so Finn and Jake take her outside so that she can see the sun. She's captivated by almost anything, and after seeing her enjoy a marshmallow, they decide to take her to the Candy Kingdom so that she can eat more sweets. Once there, though, she tries eating the candy people, specifically Peppermint Butler. Finn instructs her to not eat the ones that talk, but she takes this as, you can eat them, just not Peppermint Butler. We won't eat Red Stripe Man, only everyone else. This then turns into a massive problem, as she goes and tells the other humans that there are delicious candy people in the candy kingdom for them to eat. Finn and Jake warn PB of the oncoming danger and she devises a plan to try and make the candy people scary. But this doesn't work, as they're just too cute to ever be scary. I mean, look at that face. Because the humans are not scared by the candy people, a battle unfolds with some of the Marshmallow Kids thinking that they can defeat the humans with fire, resulting in them catching on fire. My people! The humans take off their now on fire hats, only to reveal that they're actually mutated with gills and fins. Finn wonders if Susan is also a mutant, as she didn't take off her hat. But before he can, she runs away with her fellow humans. We'll just be gooey for a while. <laughs> In the beginning of Wake Up, it is shown that Jake is hanging out with Prismo, which must happen often as they seem pretty buddy-buddy with each other. Eventually, Jake makes it home to find Finn in deep thought, contemplating his dad and his newfound knowledge that he's being held in cosmic prison Citadel. Jake decides to ask Prismo for guidance, and they both teleport to him. He says that the only way to get Finn's dad is to commit a cosmic crime. He then tells them to bring him a sleeping man without waking him up. It proves to be difficult, but the two manage it to get it done. Once the sleeping man is safely in the time room, Prismo explains that the only reason he exists is because of the dreams of the sleeping old man. Waking him up would essentially kill Prismo until the old man goes to sleep again in about a thousand years. Killing a Time Master is a cosmic crime. Poof! I'm a goner. Thus ends mighty Prismo. So he's willing to die since he'll eventually come back anyway. Jake is extremely upset about this since he's become really close with Prismo. Just as the boys were about to wake up the old man, the Lich wakes up from his coma that he's been in since the wish-granting episodes. See Main Meat to find out more about that. He wakes up the old man, killing Prismo. And to make sure Prismo never regenerates, he also kills the old man. Old man Prismo! No! <laughs> The Lich starts to be taken to Citadel as he's the one who actually committed a cosmic crime, leaving Finn and Jake to hold on to him for dear life as he's dragged away to the Citadel. Escape from the Citadel begins right where we left off, with Finn and Jake heading towards the Citadel with the Lich. Once there, they look for Finn's dad, which he ends up finding in one of the crystal cells. Since the Lich is also there, and is an evil mastermind, I might add, he breaks everyone free using his evil goo. Once free. Finn's dad seems less than thrilled that Finn has found him. He actually seems completely uninterested and unbothered by him. Finn begins to ask him why he was abandoned, but his father is too busy trying to escape to pay him any mind. 
one of the guardians of the prison ends up shooting Martin, Finn's father's, leg off, prompting Martin to order Finn to get the blood of one of the guardians since they have healing powers. After healing his leg, he abandons Finn yet again running away with the other prisoners. The Lich then breaks free and tries to kill Finn and Jake. Fall. Finn realizes that the Guardian's blood hurts the Lich and begins throwing chunks of it at him. Before finishing off the Lich though, Finn realizes that his dad is about to completely escape without them and he still hasn't gotten any answers yet. His dad is trying really hard to abandon his child right now as he promotes himself as leader of the Runaways and does everything in his power to avoid talking to Finn again, such as cutting off Finn's passageway to him and spawning a void to suck up him and the other Runaways before Finn can get to him. While trying to escape, Finn is determined to hold onto the large platform that his dad is on, so much so that Finn's grass sword engulfs his entire arm trying to hold onto his dad. Pedal to the metal! Finn is so stubborn that his entire arm flies off without him, while his father abandons him yet again. Hey, what about Eric? Finn falls into the water, and while there's a small part of the Guardian's blood touching his nub of an arm, and a tiny flower grows, Jake drags a sad Finn out of the water. He reveals that the Lich actually turned into a baby man and appears harmless. Finn and Jake then give the baby to Tree Trunks, who is an adorable old lady elephant. There will be more on her if we make another Adventure Time episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and maybe we will. Part 1 of the miniseries, Islands. This episode takes place after pre-boot and reboot, that I mention in the main meat section of this video. For a brief recap, Susan attacked Finn and Jake after her head got banged up and an electronic chip in her malfunctioned. Anyway, the episode begins with a human ship flying onto the shores of Ooh looking for Susan Strong. It only responds to Finn, though, as it's programmed to recognize humans. Finn finds Susan and apologizes for attacking her with his grass arm. She apologizes as well, since she was the one who started it, and he tells her about the ship. Susan investigates what's going on and has a feeling she needs to go back to wherever she came from. Coordinates print out from her old head implant, which leads to an island far away. Finn also decides to join her because he wants to find out more about the human race. By default, Jake also goes with Finn. The gang says their goodbyes and heads off on their journey. The gang start their journey and meet a silly dragon named Whipple. Whipple is quite annoying and ends up making them all want earbuds from Jake. Bimo, who nobody knew was on the ship, makes a ruckus. And he needs to be told! No one wants to hear your ideas! It becomes apparent to Whipple that they all find him annoying. He gets upset and crashes their boat, leaving Jake to turn into a sailboat so they can all stay afloat. It then becomes obvious that Jake is hallucinating while heading straight for a bunch of poisonous seaweed. Meanwhile, he thinks he's heading towards his parents. A scared Susan and Finn fight against Jake, leading him to throw them off of his body, only for them to find that there are actually poisonous jellyfish causing Jake to hallucinate into the poisonous seaweed. They punch away the jellyfish, and Jake gets better. Later on, they pressure Finn into telling them why this journey means so much to him, and he confides in them that he's tired of remaining ignorant about his species, and that he will get to the bottom of it. Whipple shows up again, seemingly out of nowhere, and tells Finn that he knows how he feels, and that he's sorry for wrecking their ship. Sorry I broke your boat. Sorry we said you were annoying. He also warns them of great danger, and that the island they're searching for can be lethal. Right at the end of his speech, the gang is pulled down into the ocean by a colossus of the deep, which is basically a massive man robot. Finn awakens on an island all alone. After wandering the island for quite some time, he gets caught in a bear trap, which just so happens to be owned by an old lady. <laughs> Look at you. You're thick as heck. You're thicker than a normal Susan. Whoa! The old lady speaks, but she doesn't speak English, so there's a language barrier between her and Finn. She shows Finn a video that reveals that her name is Alva, and there used to be a lot of humans on the island, but is also showed the animals getting quite violent as well. Finn comes to the conclusion that Alva, him, and Susan must be the only humans left. Finn eventually finds Jake and draws photos of Susan and Bimo for Alva to ask if she's seen them. In response, she draws two more islands, which Finn and Jake assume Susan and Bimo must have washed up on. The episode ends with a shot of Bimo actually being on the moon somehow? What? The episode begins with Finn and Jake flying with a giant parrot to one of the other islands. When they arrive, they're greeted by literally nobody. Mm, egging me. On an island that seems to be entirely made out of electronic parts. 
There are also large balls all around, but the two don't seem to figure out what they are. They end up hearing Bimo and find him wearing virtual reality glasses. When they try to talk to him, he doesn't respond. So the boys find glasses of their own to try and talk to him in the virtual world. Once there, they find Bimo, who is seen as a muscular man who is quite popular with everybody. Once Finn and Jake are over the virtual reality, they ask Bimo if he's ready to leave, and he says he wants to stay here forever which prompts Jake to exit the virtual reality world so that he can rip off Bimo's glasses. However, when he tries to touch the glasses, he's hit by an electric shock. Jake then sees tiny robots flying around, opening the balls they were seeing which appear to be pods containing real humans with virtual reality glasses on. The little robots feed them and give them water so that they never have to leave their virtual world. Okay, Matrix. Jake shuts down the whole thing somehow in the real world, which makes Bimo cry. It also makes all the other humans pissed off. The little robots end up fixing it, and everyone goes back to their respective pods. Finn, Jake, and Bimo then use a pod to get to the next island. I can fit, I just need to... This next episode starts with Susan having a flashback from when she was little. She lived on the island she's currently on, and was taught by none other than Dr. Gross. See Preboot and Reboot in the main meat section. Dr. Gross then explains the history of humans. Long ago, after the Mushroom War, some humans survived and created their island that they currently reside on now. These humans were known as Founders, as they founded the island. Some humans, however, didn't want to live there and escaped into the world. These humans are known as Hiders. The humans that are trained to track down these humans to bring them back are known as Seekers, which, it becomes apparent, was what Susan was trained to do. Oh, and they also built the Robot Guardian, the Colossus of the Deep, to prevent humans from leaving. Kara. Yes, Dr. Gross? It is also revealed that through their electronic chip, they get strength boosts on their quest to become Seekers, which explains why Susan is so large. Susan is also shown to have a best friend who isn't being trained for anything serious like Seeking. She's training to be an educator. Her name is Frida, and she doesn't agree with Seekers and what they do. The episode then cuts to Finn, Jake, and Bimo finding Susan, but she can't see them as she's in a trance. The show then cuts to yet another flashback of Susan in action, catching hiders, one of which happens to be Martin. She actually crushes his legs when capturing him. Hey there! Wink! <laughs> and he's taken to Minerva, the doctor, for assistance. Minerva is Finn's mom, but we'll get to that soon. In another flashback, it's revealed that Frida did try to leave the island as she wanted Susan to go with her. Susan, wanting to help a friend and reluctant to turn her in, did help her take the boat that she had to make to the beach. Frida wanted Susan to come with her, but just as Susan was about to respond, Dr. Gross appeared, who assumed something weird was going on based on how Susan was acting. Dr. Gross then pulled out a remote control and forced Susan to capture Frida and destroy her boat. The show then flashes back to Finn asking Susan if she's okay, to which she responds, My name is Kara, which is revealed through her flashback since that is what Frida was calling her. This episode begins with Susan trying to start up an old transport ship that would allow her to take them to Founders Island. It is then that she tells Finn that he might also be able to meet his mother. The show then flashes back to one of Minerva's memories. After Martin was taken to her doctor's office, they slowly fell in love. He takes her on dates, and she tells the Founders that he needs more medical attention just so they can spend more time together. They eventually have a child, Finn and Martin is left to take care of him while Minerva is at work. <laughs> yeah, that's Mr. Bear. Pretty interesting guy, huh? One day, Martin's bad deeds catch up with him, and he's chased by an angry widow, who he swindled by exposing them to the Seekers. Martin has no choice but to jump on a raft with Baby Finn, leaving the island. He ends up having to push Finn out to sea while he fights the Colossal Deep in order to get away. Hello. In real time, the gang is headed for Founders Island. I'll be back for you. Once on the island, the gang is greeted by dozens of humans, who are mostly interested in Jake, a talking dog. Can I rub your dog's tummy, mister? He's got a cute yellow tummy. It is only when Jake starts transforming that they grow weary of him and cower away in fear. Their fright causes the Minerva bots, who Finn had just tried to approach thinking that they were his real mother, to come up to Jake and tranquilize him. Finn also ends up getting captured by the Minervas, and they run tests on them, one being taking their blood. And Minervas find out that Finn is indeed their long-lost child and take him to the motherboard of Minerva. You're beautiful. <laughs> 
It is there that they learn of a great plague that Dr. Gross accidentally caused that wiped out most of the humans. Minerva, wanting to continue to help the humans, turned herself into a motherboard hive mind in order to stay alive. She also tells Finn and Jake that she ordered Dr. Gross to send her strongest seeker, Kara, to find her lost child, but Kara never returned. Minerva is extremely happy to have found Finn and tells him that he is safe now and that he can live safely on the island. Finn explains that he has been safe and that he doesn't need to stay on the island, to which the Minerva bots hug him tighter and tells him that he will stay forever. Continuing on with Minerva's obsession, Finn is desperately trying to convince his mother that he doesn't need to stay on the island, even resorting to showing her his memories on how he's been doing thus far. She claims that Ooh sounds much too dangerous for him and insists that he stays. Meanwhile, Kara has found Frida and is trying to reignite her adventurous spirit, probably in hopes that she will leave the island with them. Finn, angry with his mother, gives a large speech to the humans about how fun life can be outside the island. Even Frida ends up regaining her spirit and gets excited about leaving. Hearing this commotion, however, Minerva shoots a warning that she will send them all to the virtual reality island if they continue on this path. Finn returns to Minerva, and after telling her about all the people he's helped in Ooh, convinces her to let them go, along with any humans that want to leave with him. She says that him being brought up in that place has made him a wonderful helper, and that essentially she's proud of him for turning out like herself. Ironically, almost all of the humans decline the offer to leave, as they're afraid of the sudden offer. Frida agrees though, and she and Susan decide to go off on their own adventure. I kind of like Susan better. Okay, Susan. The last scene is of Finn saying goodbye to his mother. They share a touching hug, and Finn cries as he says goodbye. Be careful when you're eating blueberries. Too many can hurt your tummy. The episode begins with PB asking Finn and Jake to find the missing hangers. Several of her subjects have said that their hangers have gone missing. Finn and Jake find Ice King trying to sneak into the dry cleaners to steal even more hangers. Ice King asks the boys to come back to his castle with him. Once there, he explains that he dropped his keys in a deep hole and is trying to get them back out. The hangers are sucked into the same hole the keys were in and the boys decide to launch an investigation. Once inside the hole, they find an orb with a lady inside. Ice King breaks it open and the girl reveals herself as Patience. What year is this? Uh, nobody really keeps time like that. The Ice Elemental. She asks about the other elementals, Slime, Candy, and Fire. The boys are suspicious of her, but Ice King unfortunately tells her immediately of the princesses. Patience requests that they be captured, to which the Ice King agrees. Naturally, the boys don't want this to happen, so she freezes them. After being captured, Patience explains to the princesses that there have always been embodiments of the four elements, ice, slime, candy, and fire. She says that she is the old embodiment of ice, and that she urged the old embodiments of the other elements to freeze themselves since there was about to be a catastrophic event killing most of the earth. The other girls refused to freeze themselves, leaving her to be frozen since that time and being broken free just that day. We can unlock our true potential! <laughs> She shows the other girls her powers, which they use to defeat her and escape. Patience then says that she's about to start some crazy biz, while being restrained by a bunch of slime. After learning of her elemental power previously in Elementals, PB is annoyed that the slime princess has such strong slime powers while she can barely create one jelly bean. Bye, hater! That night, while in a dream, she meets one of the previous owners of the candy element and he unlocks her mind. She then has quite powerful jelly bean powers, strong enough to fight an entity that begins terrorizing the candy kingdom. She ends up defeating the being but is upset with herself at hurting so many innocents with her powers in the process. Patience is then shown examining the other elements. This episode takes place right after the Islands miniseries that is mentioned in the Finn and Jake find their parents part of the video. Finn and Jake just return home to find their tree fort has been turned into candy. Just then, a bunch of candy versions of them and their friends enter, and Finn is weirded out by this. I'm Shelby the Worm, the gummy worm. On the other hand, Jake is amused and not concerned at all for some reason. Distraught, Finn decides to go to the Candy Kingdom to ask PB about all of this. They find out that PB is actually the castle itself and has become a pure candy elemental. She also claims that she has fixed everyone by turning them all into candy. Skyhooks appear from the sky, which are just hangers tied together that Ice King created, and he flies them to the Cloud Kingdom, which has not been overrun by the Candy Elemental. This frustrates PB as they have escaped, but claims that they will be back because they have nowhere else to go. 
It is also shown that the land of Wu has been completely divided into the four elements. Yes, I'm me. But everything else is weird. Ice King then tells the boys how everything started. Patience was working on a way to restore the elements to their pure forms. All of a sudden, Betty showed up. Maddening and I'm rapping and... and... <sighs> and took Ice King on a date. To her dismay, he didn't remember her at all. Yeah, who's this Simon guy you keep yakking about? Shall I be jealous? She then goes back to the ice castle and makes Ice King floating birds while they make up from their previous fight. That's when Patience notices her magical abilities and freezes her. Patience then forms a type of ritual with the four elementals. Ice King, Finn, and Jake find a way into the Ice Kingdom after floating down. They eventually run into Patience, who explains that she's trying to return the Land of Wu back to the elemental domain like how it used to be. She's using Betty's power as a sort of battery to further her spell. The only issue that she runs into is that the spell took over the princesses and turned them into monsters, rather than powerful beings like her. Ice King then finds Betty frozen and escapes with her. Ah, weird lady. Ah. Finn and Jake following quickly afterwards. Once Betty is melted, she explains that with the Enchiridion, she would be able to counter the spell, which Finn and Jake have the Enchiridion from the farm world Finn. See main meat to go deeper into that. Betty urges Finn and Jake to take a nap and relax for a minute, but during their nap, the cloud they were sleeping on drifts far away. Once awake, Finn starts freaking out and reveals to Jake that he feels responsible for Ooh and all that has happened. Jake also confides in Finn about how he feels responsible for Finn's emotions and distracting him from bad thoughts. The two bond and appear happy. Finn and Jake then find a creature that Jake names Cloudy. Hey Cloudy, what do you want to eat a smelly old dog for? Thanks. They ride Cloudy back to the Ice King and Betty, where Betty explains that she has found where to get the crystals for the Enchiridion. The episode begins with Finn and Jake entering the Slime Kingdom in hopes to retrieve her crystal. Once there, they find that the Slime Kingdom has become basically a massive roller skating rink. There's even a race, and if you win, you get the honor to go inside of a massive version of what Slime Princess once was. I'm gonna get that jewel! Noticing that the crystal they are needing is inside the body of Slime Princess, Finn decides to enter the race with Jake and LSP. They lose, but are still absorbed into the Slime Princess as their punishment ended up being shameful absorption. Finn was able to get to the crown, but Jake ended up literally becoming slime like everybody else. Finn too was about to become slime until LSP revealed that she wasn't actually made of slime, which caused the Slime Princess to evict them from her. Finn vows to get Jake back, and the two of them go back to the Cloud Kingdom. This episode begins with the gang now going after the Flame Crystal. Finn is still upset about Jake disappearing, but LSP smacks Finn's pictures out of his hand in order to make him focus on the task at hand. Finn, LSP, and Gunter enter the Flame Kingdom and are attacked by a fiery version of Lady Rainicorn. Everyone in the Fire Kingdom seems to be much angrier, which seems to be a parallel as everyone in the Ice Kingdom was gloomy and everyone was happy in the Candy Kingdom. Trying not to upset himself, which causes him to erupt into flames, Finn has Gunter and LSP fight her instead. Quack, quack. I can't. She's like family. And eventually are greeted by Cinnamon Bun, who refuses to take them to the princess. Eventually, the three make it into the remains of the Flame Kingdom. They find a dragon that has the flame crystal in its teeth. Thinking that the dragon must have eaten Flame Princess, Finn attacks, only to find out that the dragon itself is Flame Princess. During the fighting, Finn gets really upset leading him to become Flame Finn and getting violent as well. LSP ends up getting really upset and mentions how the people in the Candy Kingdom don't act like this. This then causes the Flame Princess to announce an attack on the Candy People. All of the Fire People approach the Candy Kingdom in violence, even Fire Finn. Is this the end? Finn almost stabs PB as well until LSP grabs a chunk of her gum and rubs it into Finn's face in order for him to remember himself and all the good times he had with her. LSP tells Finn that he can't stab someone he loves. Finn ends up remembering and returning to normal, grabbing PB's gem in the process. As the battle goes on, PB ends up turning all the flame people into candy, even Flame Princess. As this happens, Finn takes her gem as well. Betty and Ice King show up on their magic flying carpet and ask for the gems. Finn hands them over, but instead of rescuing them from the candy people, Betty laughs menacingly and flies away. <laughs> That's sweet. 
Continuing on with the last episode, Finn and LSP end up running away from the approaching candy people slash transformation. Finn finds out that LSP must be immune to the elementals because she is yet to be affected by even a singular one, to which LSP claims that she didn't pay attention in class when learning about Lumpy Race. Meanwhile, it is revealed that Betty doesn't plan on using the Enchiridion to rescue Ooh. She plans on using it to rip a hole in time and space so that she can go back in time to before Simon ever put on the ice crown. Maybe I can even stop the mushroom war. <laughs> preventing him from ever going insane or becoming the Ice King. Ice King is weirded out by her and wants to talk about what's going on. He ends up kicking the Enchiridion during her spell. Can you turn this off and we can talk, maybe? Causing her to blow up in a spark and disappear. Going back to the Candy Kingdom, PB has started transforming the lands around her into candy as well. In doing so, she ends up candifying the Ice Land completely, causing Patience to freeze herself yet again to avoid this fate. Ice King then flies down to join Finn and LSP, bringing them the Enchiridion. LSP becomes upset with Finn for doing experiments on her to try and figure out how she can null out the elements. When she gets angry, all of the gems fly to her and she begins transforming the land back to normal. When doing so, it is shown that Jake returns to normal as well, and the two are reunited. Jake reappears in his true form, and Finn says they will try to get him back to normal. This episode introduces the Enchiridion, which is a very important book that will be used later in the plot. The information on where the book resides is gifted to Finn after he rescues Princess Bubblegum from a silly event. It's supposed to only be given to someone who is a true hero of righteous power. Finn and Jake set out on a journey to retrieve the book and are given many challenges along the way. During Finn's last trial, he's told to squash an ant, refusing since the ant is not evil. It's just a neutral being. He wins the ability to find the Enchiridion. Finn is then given the book over a cute picnic with the book's caretakers. Jake, this party is so crazy! This episode begins with Finn, Jake, and Princess Bubblegum all meditating together. While meditating, Princess Bubblegum has an alarming vision of a dark figure. She panics and tells Finn and Jake to come with her while she checks on something, also giving them protective gems to guard them against the evil figure she ends up taking them to, the Lich. The gems are said to be able to protect against possession or evil spirits that the Lich might inflict on them. Princess Bubblegum explains that the Lich is a very powerful creature that tried destroying all of Ooh. The only reason he's captured is because Billy defeated him and placed him in the amber that he now resides. Then, all of a sudden, a snail comes out of Finn's backpack, and not being protected by a gem is possessed and makes a crack in the amber containing the Lich. He escapes, and Finn is given Billy's old gauntlet, the same one that he defeated the Lich with the first time. Me too. While Finn is chasing down the Lich, Ice King constantly pesters him, trying to get his approval to marry Princess Bubblegum. Look, I wrote her name all over my arms and legs. Yuck. This distracts Finn and causes the Lich to release hundreds of evil souls. They all chase the Lich and Finn starts to fight him. The Lich, now having some of his power back from the souls, is able to destroy the gauntlet and knock Jake out. In the process, Finn's gem also breaks, causing the Lich to possess Finn's body. While possessed, the Lich asks Finn if he's cold, and Finn responds with, I have a sweater on! Resisting the Lich and not actually jumping into his well of power that he wanted him to, the Lich becomes enraged and tries killing Finn with fire, but the sweater protects him. The sweater ended up having protective power since Princess Bubblegum gave it to him and she loves him. Finn battles it out with the Lich after the Lich embarrassingly loses against a pink sweater. Finn then uses the sweater to behead the Lich and presumably save them all. Ice King then accidentally drops Princess Bubblegum into the Well of Power, much to everyone's horror. Oops, I've got the dropsies. Continuing on with the last episode, Princess Bubblegum was dropped into the Well of Power. The episode starts off with Princess Bubblegum being treated at the candy hospital with Finn and Jake right by her side. She doesn't look to be doing so well and looks like a piece of chewed up gum. The Ice King tries to explain that something weird happened when dropping her into the well, but Finn is so mad at him for letting it happen he doesn't listen to him. After being stabilized, Princess Bubblegum almost looks gray and everyone can tell that something is off with her. Jake is much more suspicious of her. She set her entire room on fire when she didn't like Jake's song and dance. <laughs> Jake. Which further confirms his belief that something bad must have happened to her while in the well. Jake forces Finn to acknowledge her being weird, telling him about the fire and forcing Finn to see what she's doing in the bathroom. Oh my globe! Come on, man, that's pervy! When looking through the lock on the doorknob, 
They see Princess Bubblegum throwing all of the hazardous materials into her bathtub and then drinking it all. Princess Bubblegum then grows into what looks like a giant demon. Ice King shows up and explains that he saw her get possessed by the Lich, but sometimes he has weird visions and didn't want to alarm anybody if it wasn't true. He also offers his assistance, but it isn't until Jake gets hurt that Finn agrees. After the Lich is defeated once again, Princess Bubblegum's body is destroyed from smashing onto the ground after being frozen. The doctors try to put her back together, but are slightly unsuccessful. When she returns, the doctors announce that while they were able to somewhat save her, as a lack of enough bubblegum pieces, she is now 13. Oh, dang it! Well, I'm out of here. Goodbye, everyone. This episode starts with Finn having a bad dream about the Lich attacking Billy. When he wakes, he tells Jake and they both decide to go tell Billy of their nightmare. When they reach Billy and explain what happened, Billy asks them if they want to help him kill the Lich, to which they both agree. They start collecting all the gems from the different princesses. I want candy. And Billy explains to the boys that the Enchiridion is actually a magical book. And if you turn the sword on the front, it opens up to a secret page regarding the gems. Once all the gems are collected, it opens up a portal to different dimensions and universes. The middle of this universe being the time room where Prismo lives. It's said previously that finding Prismo would result in you being able to have one of your wishes granted. The only gem they needed left is Princess Bubblegums. When they reach her, she is adamant that she doesn't want to give it away. Her and Finn get in a tussle, but Finn wins and takes the gem. While outside, Princess Bubblegum quickly emerges and tells them that Billy isn't actually the real Billy, it's actually the Lich. The Candy Guardian hits him and reveals his face, which is quite horrifying for a cartoon. Finn, not knowing what to do, decides to break the book in half, hoping that this would prevent the Lich from being able to use it. Instead, him breaking it actually causes the portal to open. Even though they try to stop him, they're unsuccessful, and he makes it through. The episode then cuts to Farm World, Finn and Jake, in a different animation style that emits a slight eerie vibe. Continuing on with the last episode, once Finn and Jake enter the portal, they see the Lich ask Prismo for something and he vanishes. They shortly after find out that he wished for all of life to cease to exist. Panicking, Finn wishes that the Lich never existed. The show cuts to the Farmland version of Finn again. Farmland Finn needs money for his father. And while searching, he finds Ice King's crown of all things, still attached to Ice King slash Simon. After taking off the crown, Finn wants to put it on, but before he does, that farmland Marceline shows up and says that he can't do that, and that a simple human cannot wear that crown. She also tells a tale about how Simon used the crown to save everybody from destruction after the Great Mushroom War. In doing so, he prevented a large bomb from hitting, but also died. Because the crown's master died, it sent ice to cover the earth for 400 years. Ever since then, Marceline has been watching over Simon's body and the crown to make sure another human doesn't put the crown on. As per usual, Finn doesn't listen to those he doesn't know slash trust and takes it away. Marceline chases him down and begs him not to put it on. I am big dead! Woo! But when conflict arises, he ends up doing it anyway. Continuing on yet again, when Finn puts the crown on, he uses his newfound power and accidentally sets off the bomb from the Mushroom War. Horrible images pass, and he's only able to save his family. Jake? Jake! <laughs> Meanwhile, Jake, Prismo, and Cosmic Owl have a hot tub moment, where they're rapping and having a grand time. When encouraged to use his wish, Jake wished for a sandwich and said that he's sure Finn will be fine. It isn't until the TV they're watching Finn from becomes unmuted and Jake realizes how much danger Finn is actually in. Jake, being too scared to make a mistake, takes Prismo's advice in wishing to change the Lich's wish from destroying all life to Finn and Jake being returned to Ooh. The two land back at the Candy Kingdom and life is not all dead. Take the sign off when you tell me where you hid daddy's crown jewels. In this later episode, we find out about Finn's past lives and also get a hint at how old Princess Bubblegum actually is. The episode starts by showing a scary ghost lady that Finn keeps seeing. He tells Jake, and Jake says Finn needs to go into his vault to find out who the scary lady is. Finn's vault is basically his repressed memories that he doesn't want to think about. Because Finn doesn't want to open his vault, with the help of Bimo, Jake hypnotizes him into remembering. Once inside his vault, Finn sees his past lives, a blue comet, a butterfly, a pink glob of goo, and finally, a girl, the ghost lady, riding a white tiger. It's revealed that the ghost girl's name is Shoko, and Shoko also seems to be someone who does almost anything for some cash. Shoko gets a job from a gang to steal Princess Bubblegum's amulet. She goes to the Candy Kingdom, 
pretends to get hurt by the gang, and gets rescued. While in the care of Princess Bubblegum, Shoko confides in her how her parents sold her arm, and Princess Bubblegum seems upset by this. Shoko actually starts to really like Princess Bubblegum, because she seems to be one of the only people who actually cares about her. PB begins to trust her so much that she lets Shoko help create one of the Gumball Guardians. After they are created, PB gives Shoko a mechanical arm to replace the one stolen from her. Shoko is extremely sad, because she knows if she doesn't steal the amulet, she will be killed by the gang. She ends up stealing the amulet off PB's neck in a panic after being caught by one of the guardians. Are you okay, princess? Jeez, you're so loud! The guardian zaps her, and she falls into a green river of toxic waste. PB tries to save her, but there's nothing she can do. Finn then wakes up and calls PB saying that the past needs to be reconciled. Suddenly, it flashes back to Shoko crawling out of the toxic river and crawling to a tree sapling, the same tree that Finn and Jake live in. When PB arrives at their treehouse, Finn digs up the floorboards in the kitchen. What was that? Oh no. Dog drang it, Finn. Revealing Shoko laying there, handing him the amulet. He gives it to PB and says that he is Shoko. He also confronts PB about the fact that she's actually a bajillion years old, not 19 to which she just nervously laughs. This episode begins with Finn buying a grass sword from a sketchy man after his sword starts to not work anymore. He's told multiple times that the sword is cursed, as it cuts too perfectly. It also ends up literally fusing to his arm. Finn only starts to believe these allegations, though, when he has a weird dream about the sword completely taking over his body and causing him to deteriorate in the wind. Finn goes back to where he found the sword and is told that he will suffer an eternal curse that the sword will never leave him. Finn is completely fine by this, and the sword morphs back into his arm. The wizard that cursed him is upset that Finn is fine with the grass sword arm thing, but Finn is unfazed. Plus, once he accepted the sword, it became much easier to wield. In this episode, we find out about Orgalorg, a cosmic entity who is shown to be as old as the Lich. Orgalorg is said to be the breaker of worlds and is obsessed with destroying entire planets. The episode starts off with Gunter and the other penguins in Ice King's care wanting to throw a party. To achieve this, they put a sleep grenade in Ice King's cheesecake and force him to eat it. All right, maybe just another teeny corner. During their rager, Lumpy Space Princess arrives and during an epic walrus race gets attacked. Gunter has to save her and in doing so, he slams into the wall and a massive green brain appears to come out of his head. He begins having flashes of different images, a comet, and what looks to be Abe Lincoln. Gunter goes down to his basement and cuts wood carvings out of different symbols. After doing so, he somehow connects his mind to them and transmits to what appears to be a swampy planet. It is here that we learn of Orgalorg's past. The grandma alien claims that Orgalorg used to be a very powerful cosmic entity that would prey upon worlds. When the Catalyst Comet was around, he sought to absorb it, but Abe Lincoln ordered him to be hit down instead. In doing so, he fell to Earth and transformed into Gunter. Meanwhile, Gunter's mind energy is projected onto the planet, and all the aliens start screaming in fear. Gunter sees their frightened expressions and hears their screams, which snaps him out of his trance. He decides to smash the wooden fingers that he had created, but in doing so, he starts to remember his life on Earth before meeting the Ice King. Eventually, Ice King wakes up and gets upset with Gunter about him smashing wood all over the floor. Little does he know who he's actually dealing with. This later episode shows a new election to see who the people of the Candy Kingdom want in power. PB doesn't even campaign because she's worried about an oncoming comet that she notices in the sky. She is their creator and assumes they will be smart enough to vote for her, especially considering that everything she does is with them in mind. Her opponent, King of Ooh, is quite convincing, however, and marks a lot of her own people to turn on her. After the votes are counted, it is found that PB has been voted out of power. She contemplates if maybe she made them to be too stupid, but she's also outraged at her being blindsided by her own people. You're our Dillweed secretary, and you're probably some Dillweed I've never met! She moves away with Peppermint Butler to an old shack she says her uncle made a long time ago. Before she leaves, she tells Finn and Jake to stay near the Candy Kingdom to watch after her candy people and make sure that they are safe. While Finn and Jake are wandering around, a purple hue starts to cover the sky, which is caused by the oncoming comet. Finn and Jake search for the King of Ooh so he can address the city and calm them down. While searching, they find someone messing with PB's spaceship, 
They charge the intruder but are shot with a laser gun. Eventually, Jake knocks the intruder over only to reveal Gunter? Gunter has a huge blue brain and he's also able to talk. Meanwhile, it's shown that the King of Wu is a horrible leader, as he still has yet to even try to calm down the candy people. The episode ends with PB going outside to get some fresh air and seeing something blow up in the kingdom and the purple sky. Continuing on with the last episode, Finn and Jake find their way into the spaceship that is now taking off and are confronted with Gunter's true form, Orgalorg. After telling Orgalorg that they could definitely beat him in a fight, he sends them flying through space. Finn ends up slamming into his father, Martin, in his giant moth spaceship thing, who is talked about in the parent section of this video. Martin explains that he can't actually control the moth and it goes where it wants. The moth, coincidentally, starts flying directly towards Orgalorg. Orgalorg, meanwhile, starts absorbing the comet. Finn jumps into Orgalorg's mouth to try and stop what's happening slash free the comet from absorption. The comet tells Finn that if he wants, he can start a new life altogether. That Finn used to be the comet in a past life the one that crashed into Earth, confirming the information from the vault we mentioned prior. Finn says that he's put a lot of work into his life now and wants to see it through. Martin, on the other hand, gladly takes the offer and is transported to another state of being with his moth. This upsets Finn, as he is tired of his dad always running away. You burn enough bridges, the only direction to move is forward. <laughs> Orgalorg, Finn, and Jake are flung back to Earth and are unharmed. And because of falling back to Earth, Orgalorg is transformed back into Gunter. A side note for the viewers, Bonnie is PB's real name and is used throughout the series whenever she's not in princess position. I haven't been doing this just for the sake of confusion, but starting this episode, I'm going to switch over to calling PB Bonnie instead. Clear as mud? Great. This episode takes place directly after the comet situation. Since Finn and Jake are the ones who save the world, they're honored by the king. The king then gives them a task to go into one of the most dangerous rooms in the Candy Kingdom in hopes of treasure. The boys enter and find a dragon that seems to be leaking juice that fuels all the Candy Kingdom. The king wishes to monetize this, and when approaching the dragon, it freaks out and breaks free. Finn and Jake, not knowing what to do and having absolutely no faith in the King of Ooh, rush to Bonnie's cabin in search of assistance. She explains that the dragon is actually her brother, Nettie, who was birthed from the same gum that birthed her. She becomes worried for him and explains that he is quite sensitive and they need to rescue him. During their flight, on a giant swan, okay, Bonnie has a flashback of her birth. Even as saplings, he was quite afraid of everything, which is why he's been locked up in his safe space. They eventually find her brother cowering in a cave and return him to his home. Bonnie explains to the boys that she was born with a bunch of gum-like entities and she turned them into the people of the Candy Kingdom, successfully creating the castle with her brother. My candles were starting to turn. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. In this episode, Marceline finds out about Bonnie's exile from the Candy Kingdom. It starts with Marceline flying to the Candy Kingdom in hopes that Bonnie will go to the gas station with her so that she can suck the red out of the slushies, only for her to find out that the person she's been talking to was the King of Ooh dressed up in Bonnie's nightgown. Tell Bubblegum I wear her nightgown! Tell everyone! Marceline angrily goes to the cabin where Bonnie is now staying and confronts her about her disappearance from the Candy Kingdom. Bonnie explains that she was wanting a new start in life and might even make a new kingdom made of vegetables. She's staying up late trying to find the varmints who are eating her crops. The varmints inevitably show up and they chase them down into some sewers. Marceline makes a comment about how she and Bonnie used to hang out down there frequently before she became the princess. The two find the mother vermin and battle only to be left even deeper in the sewers. It is there that they find an old graffiti tag that Bonnie wrote after Marceline dared her to do so. Bonnie has a breakdown, crying about how she pushed everyone away, thinking that that would make her satisfied. How if she was the perfect princess, then everything would be fine. Now she's stuck in a hole and can't even look after her own plants. She got dethroned and is all alone. Marceline tells her that it's okay and that she doesn't need to apologize. Marceline then rescues them both and sends them to the surface. Marceline then watches over the pumpkin patch for Bonnie while she finally sleeps. 
Okay, so this episode begins with a lot of weird stuff going on. Finn and Jake climb a mountain of frozen bodies. The Enchiridion is there, and farm world Finn is also there proclaiming victory on his newfound world. The show then flashes back to an hour earlier as to how all of this came to be. Prismo calls the boys up in real time and asks for their help. He explains that back in the episode Finn the Dog and Jake the Human, that the farm world that existed after Finn's wish still exists, even after Jake technically got rid of his wish ever happening. And now, the farm world Finn, also called Ice Finn, has control over the Ice Crown and has teamed up with the farm world Lich. The Ice Finn is using his world's Enchiridion to try and make a portal to the real world that they live in. Prismo is freaking out about this because he says he will get into a lot of trouble if his boss finds out. My boss will hold me responsible. He gives Finn a briefcase and tells him to take care of it. The show then flashes back to the ice situation. It is revealed that the object inside of the briefcase is actually a large horn that is supposed to fix time and space bug-ups. Finn, not being able to kill himself, even if it's in the form of another dimension, diverts from his plan and tries to steal away his Enchiridion instead. That's not gonna work, you guys! Don't walk away from the maid! No! Ice Finn then attempts to freeze the real Finn, but it is mostly unsuccessful due to Jake distracting him. Billy from the farm world warns him that something evil is coming. The Lich arrives. It is then found that Ice Finn is actually teamed up with the Lich and that everything was his idea. Ice Finn then freezes Finn and the Lich makes Jake fall asleep. After the portal is created, the Lich tells Ice Finn that he just used him to get closer to his end goal and that he will die. Angry at this, he takes away his Ice Crown gem and deactivates the portal. Meanwhile, Finn's grass arm awakens and saves Jake from death and is also fighting for him. Finn then convinces Ice Finn to help him and they both use the maid to get rid of the Lich. Prismo is happy and Finn is glad he didn't have to kill his alternate self. Finn asks Prismo to help Ice Finn out so Prismo makes it so that he never got the Ice Crown in the first place and he ends up going back to normal. Wow folks, that was… That was a lot. Does anybody else need a breather? Whew. Okay, let's keep going. Freeboot begins with Susan Strong, which will be more talked about in the Finn and Jake's parent segment of this video. Finn and Jake exploring Butopia, a place deep underground that resembles the modern world and seems to be a sort of abandoned mall. All of a the sudden, there appears to be an earthquake, so they all run out, only to reveal a giant robotic worm containing none other than Tiffany, a boy Jake used to be in a gang with whom they presumed to be dead, after previously being eaten by the worm. Tiffany explains that he was actually saved and given a robotic arm by someone named Dr. Gross. They meet Dr. Gross and are given a tour of the ship, which contains a lot of creatures with mechanical body parts. One of the animals tries to warn Jake that something weird is going on, but before Jake can figure that out, Dr. Gross quickly moves them along to the examiner room. She gives them all lollipops and explains that she genetically engineered humans to have upgrades. It is also revealed that she herself is a human revealing that more humans still exist. The boys quickly realize that the lollipops caused them all to be paralyzed. I can't move my limb slash torso! Dr. Gross, help! Dr. Gross starts prepping Susan for surgery, but claims she already has been implanted with something. After saying this, Susan kicks her across the room, revealing that she didn't actually eat the lollipop. Susan takes the boys and runs, only to be chased by Dr. Gross and her cyber-engineered animals. They eventually get caught in a net, and Tiffany is a crisis as he asks Dr. Gross not to harm them, but she ignores him. Tiffany ends up distracting Dr. Gross, while Susan and the boys are able to escape. They free the animals, but alarmingly, one of them just so happens to be a giant eel and starts heading straight for the Candy Kingdom. Tiffany will be okay, man. Reboot begins with the three of them fighting the giant eel. Susan ends up getting electrocuted, which triggers her implant that Dr. Gross was talking about. She reveals that she is a strong seeker and that her target is Finn. She grabs him and flings Jake away. Only for Bonnie to show up wondering what the ruckus was about, she orders her banana guards to go retrieve Finn as Susan is now running away with him. They teleport Finn back to the Candy Kingdom, but Susan finds this out immediately afterwards and begins to chase him yet again. Once there, Susan is hit by a laser in an attempt to stop her, but this only makes her bigger. She grabs Finn once again and takes him all the way to the beach. Is there something you want to talk about? <gasps> it is there that Jake finds them and rescues Finn. Finn and Jake merge, making the Jake suit and fighting Susan. They end up knocking off the cyber part of her and she returns to normal. It is then that Finn's grass arm starts acting up and actually completely detaches from him and morphs into its own human, Fern, leaving Finn armless. 
This is foreshadowed in a previous episode of Blade of Grass that I covered previously in this section of the video. This episode starts with Bonnie telling Finn, Jake, and Marceline about her family. Around 800 years ago, Bonnie was lonely and all she had was Nettie. As talked about previously, Nettie is quite antisocial and doesn't communicate like a normal person. Bonnie was lonely, so she decided to create her own family using the mother gum that she came from. She constructed Uncle Gumbald, Aunt Lolly, and Cousin Chickle. She was happy, and she finally had people to interact with to call family. But one day, Gumbald decided that he wanted to be in charge instead. He got the other family members to turn on Bonnie and created a Dum Dum Juice to make Bonnie susceptible to taking orders. We address the Bonnie problem. Bonnie problem. And turn her into a dumb candy person. Gumbald wasn't trying to use it on Bonnie, though, as he ended up turning Aunt Lolly and Cousin Chickle into candy people as well. Specifically, the cookie and the pinata that runs around sometimes in the show that never knows what's going on. Bonnie overhears their meeting about turning her into a candy person, and she confronts Gumbald. He then tells her that he's going to fix her as well and her dumb brother Nettie. Bonnie gets defensive and gets out her trusty pea shooter to protect Nettie and herself against Gumbald. She shoots it at his dum dum juice and it gets all over him, turning him into the stupid bowl of punch character that is seen in previous episodes. The episode then goes back to current times. Bonnie notices that Bimo's gauntlet has Gumbald's symbol on it. She starts flipping out and asking Bimo where they got it from, and Bimo responds with, Him, I got it from the person on the gauntlet. The episode then ends. It is revealed that Gumbald has created his own kingdom, Gumbaldia, with him, Lolly, and Chickle being normal again. PB instantly declares war and preps the Candy Kingdom as such. Finn and Jake, not wanting conflict, travel to Gumbaldia to try and call it off. After rescuing Gumbald from a fall while he was showing around their island, he presumably decides to call off the war. In celebration, they dump juice from a celebration bucket all over Finn and Jake and tell them to go home and give PB a big hug from them and call off the war. Once Finn and Jake get back to the Candy Kingdom to alert PB of this, she instantly knows that they've been hit with the juice and wipe them off. Peps? She then angrily declares that the war is most definitely still on. Come Along With Me is a 50-minute special for Adventure Time's last episode a touching story on how it all ends. The episode starts off with two friends, Beth and Shermie, who live roughly 1,000 years after the outcome of the Great Gumball War. They find a mechanical arm and decide to take it to the King of Wu to find out where it came from. It is then revealed that their King of Wu is none other than Bimo. After seeing the arm, Bimo tells them a story about the end of Wu. Back in real time, PB has declared war on Gumbaldia and plans on going through with it even though Finn and Marceline strongly advise her against it. Finn is scared of losing his home, and Marceline doesn't want to relive a war as she lives on hundreds of years ago, and has had drama ever since. They are unsuccessful in their wishes, and PB still plans to go through with the war. That is, until Finn uses a magic potion that makes them all, Finn, Jake, PB, Gumbald, and Fern go into a dream type of world. Finn's ultimate plan was to have them hash it out in a place where they couldn't actually hurt each other. PB is upset at first with him. PB and Gumball don't want to come to a stalemate and argue basically the entire time they're in the dream world. Don't run away from happiness. I'm gonna fix you. No, no. It's only after PB relives Gumball's life that she understands how horrible it is to be a dumb dumb candy person and that she treated him horribly for so many years. Meanwhile, Fern has a crisis after him and Finn finally defeat one of their monsters from the vault. It's the creature that has been latched onto alternate Finn that's been making him grassy. The only problem is once they defeat it, he no longer has a body, so he slowly dies for the rest of the show. Anyway, uh, moving on, they all wake up, and PB apologizes to Gumbald for all that she has done to him throughout the years. He accepts her apology, and they're about to hug it out until Aunt Lolly trips him and it's revealed that he was actually holding Dum Dum Juice. Meaning, after all that they went through in the dream world, he was still planning on essentially killing PB in the real world. Aunt Lolly does make peace with PB, and the war is called off. Everyone assumes that all is well, until a massive red baby man alien comes through a portal and into Ooh. Okay, I'm not an expert, but this seems bad. You ain't kidding, Chubbs. The episode then shows a flashback of Simon and Betty talking about Golb the manifestation of all chaos throughout the universe. Golb causes chaos everywhere, considering that's what he's made of. He creates monsters, and overall a lot of unease throughout the candy people. PB orders her banana guards to fall back, and everyone starts running around like crazy. Also, side note, when Golb showed up, so did Normal Man. 
and all he said was, we dogged up for real. It is then revealed, through Normal Man, that Betty was trying to summon the powers of Golb in order to revert Ice King back into Simon. Oh, it's weird, lady. Hey, lady. While trying to convince her to stop being weird, Ice King Finn and her fall into the mouth of Golb, and he begins digesting them. While digesting, they get reverted back to their most original forms, and Simon returns with normal Betty. They're happy. Meanwhile, Finn is freaking the flip out, because he's stuck in Golb's stomach and it's slowly going to crush them all. The gang that's outside of the stomach realize that the thing that harms Golb the most is harmonization. That is discovered after Bimo is singing to Jake and his words seem to harm the monsters that Golb created. They all decide to harmonize, and they sing for just long enough for Finn and Simon to escape. Betty decides to stay behind, as she wants to use the Ice Crown. But I can't. I'm sorry for messing everything up. Now reverted back to its original wish form, when it could grant wishes. She wishes for Golb to disappear away from Ooh. When nothing happens, she assumes that that was too powerful of a wish for the crown. She then wishes that Simon is safe instead. Then, all of the sudden, outside of Golb, we can see it transforming into a completely new form altogether. Golb is then shown wearing lashes and being an adult woman rather than a baby. You can then assume that she either wished to become Golb, or morphing into Golb was the only way to protect Simon. Either way, Golb flies back up into the portal and leaves Ooh alone. Before Golb completely disappears into the portal, it is shown that the Ice Crown got left behind. Gunter picks it up, and while Jake thinks he's going to wish to become Orgalorg again, he actually just wishes to become Ice King which nobody really has a problem with, especially since they have Simon back. The show then cuts to the future, and the boys are quite confused as Bimo kept referencing the story as the end of Ooh. But nobody really died and nothing catastrophic happened. Their questions aren't really answered though, as Bimo continues on with the story. He talks about how his friends lived out the rest of their lives. It's also shown that Finn buries the remainder of Fern in the spot where their old treehouse used to reside. It got blown up in the war. With the knowledge about the tree that supposedly grew a sword on top, the boys go to that place and climb the massive tree. He then holds up the sword just like Finn has done in every single video introduction and the show ends. It then shows Finn and Jake talking to a massive hole in the ground who asks if they want to hear a song. They say yes, and the hole sings the iconic Come Along With Me song that has been playing in almost every outro of the show. There is then a long montage showing everyone growing up and living out their best lives. Side note, I think it's up for interpretation, but personally, I believe that Bimo kept saying that it was the end of Ooh because it was the end of all of his friends as he knew them. They all grew up and are gone now, so Bimo is the only one left to tell the tale of the end of an entire era. Side note, side note, Marceline and PB totally smooch. The ship is confirmed. The ship is confirmed! During the battle, Marceline freaks out and thinks PB died, which causes her to go full demon mode and rescue her. She then confesses how much she cares about PB, and they hug and kiss. Anyway folks, that was a wild journey we just went on together. This was by far the most fun that I've had making a video, and I hope you all had fun coming along in this adventure with me. Thank you for listening. It really does mean a lot to me. Please like this video and subscribe if you want to hear more Adventure Time lore in the future. There is an infinite world inside this show and we've just scratched the surface of all it has to offer.